Hello and welcome to another episode of the Synapse e-learning series. Today we'll be discussing common skin fungal infections, their diagnosis, their prevention, and also their management. With us today we have Dr. Michael Boffa, consultant dermatologist, senior lecturer at the University of Malta, and the president of the Maltese Association of Dermatology and Venerology. Dr. Boffa, thank you for accepting your invitation here today and for being with us. Um, on to my first question, how would you classify the common fungal infections which affect the skin? Okay, so firstly, fungal infections are very common. Um, essentially, fungi colonize um, the tissue. <clears throat> so stratum corneum, nails and hair um, are apt to becoming colonized with fungi. And broadly, fungi can be divided into um, yeasts and dermatophytes. Um, yeasts are unicellular organisms, dermatophytes um, uh, classically um, multiply by forming filamentous structures. Uh, both yeasts and dermatophytes um, can cause several types of skin infections. And in fact, our aim today was to discuss the main and most common skin infections, fungal skin <coughs> infections, which we may encounter. So on to our first uh, skin infection. How do you describe Pityriasis versicolor? How does it present? Uh, Pityriasis versicolor is a yeast infection um, caused by um, Malassezia species. Um, classically, it affects the trunk um, and produces um, light-colored tan um, uh, macules, uh, which are usually a little bit scaly. Um, they occur particularly in individuals who are sweating. Um, so you see it commonly in young adolescents uh, who are active, doing sports, going to the gym, um, etc. Um, it can be quite extensive on the trunk. Uh, individually, in, in, the, in the same patient, all the lesions look roughly the same um, colour. Um, another feature is that if the skin is exposed to sunlight, the affected areas do not uh, tan. Uh, it may be slightly itchy, although itching is not a major uh, feature. And how would you manage this condition? Any common pitfalls which you should advise us against? Yes, um, the mainstay of uh, management is uh, topical uh, antifungal uh, shampoo for large areas. Um, and the most effective is ketoconazole. So this is used as a, as a shampooing uh, wash, um, left on the skin for a few minutes and then rinsed off. Um, perhaps it could be used daily for a couple of weeks and then two or three times a week, uh, long term until it clears. Um, it's important to emphasize that um, the affected ears may remain um, uh, white until the next um, uh, season of sun exposure comes along because the, um, um, the affected areas um, will remain white even after the fungus has been eliminated. Um, in more severe cases <coughs> um, or perhaps recurrent cases, um, systemic treatment uh, with uh, itraconazole or fluconazole uh, may be considered. Uh, doctor, another skin condition which also causes discoloration of the skin is pityriasis alba. How it distinguishes uh, distinguish pityriasis alba from pityriasis versicolor? Okay, pityriasis alba is yes, very common, particularly in children, um, particularly in those who are um, have darker skin skin types, um, classically affecting the face. So we get these um, uh, hypopigmented areas on the cheeks. Um, they may be a bit scaly, however, the edges are not well defined as much as pityriasis versicolor. They're often associated with a tendency uh, to eczema. Uh, they tend to recur uh, every summer, usually until adolescence. So you see them typically in children aged uh, five, six years, um, and they continue usually until puberty. Another common skin infection, fungal skin infection, is seborrheic dermatitis. Okay, seborrheic dermatitis is um, quite common. Uh, it's the condition where you get redness and flaking on the sides of the nose, medial part of the eyebrows, sometimes over the sternum, um, associated with um, dandruff. Uh, essentially, it is a dermatitis rather than a, a, an infection, so it's not purely a fungal infection. However, um, the condition is characterized by an increased presence of um, Pterosporum um, species um, and it's thought that uh, the dermatitis happens uh, let's say like a, as an immunological reaction to the presence of the yeast so in fact management involves 
uh, reducing the amount of yeast on the skin by using, uh, for instance, anti-fungal uh, shampoos. Um, Petrizes, um, uh, sorry, seborrheic dermatitis um, classically is worse in winter. It improves with sun exposure and it's often aggravated by stress, um, which are characteristic features. And any pitfalls you wish to highlight in the management of seborrheic dermatitis, particularly in the community? <coughs> yes, a, a common mistake is, is to stop treatment um, after the condition has cleared. Seborrheic dermatitis is essentially a long-term condition, so individuals who suffer with the condition should continue treatment with an antifungal shampoo uh, indefinitely. Um, as regards uh, the skin, um, uh, the skin um, may or may not require long-term treatment, uh, obviously depending on the severity. Um, as regards the um, seborrhea in the scalp, um, keeping the hair short is also uh, helpful. Mm -hmm. And with regards to the seasonal variation, there's nothing actually one can do to treat that, apart from compliance to therapy. That's right. Exactly. Um, what about Candida albicans? What can you tell us about this common skin infection? Okay, Candida, again, very common. It is a commensal, so we all have it on our skin, and in most people it doesn't cause any problems. But under certain um, conditions, um, the uh, yeast will multiply and become pathogenic. Um, there are a number of factors that um, encourage growth of Candida. The most um, important is diabetes. Uh, candida thrives in a sugary environment, um, and indeed, treatment is doomed to failure unless uh, diabetes is controlled. Um, essentially, if you get hyperglycemia, like you get um, sugar coming out in the urine, you're going to get sugar coming out in the sweat, uh, in the skin, and this encourages growth of candida. Uh, it can affect um, various parts of the body, particularly the, the flexures, because another factor that encourages candida to grow is maceration of the skin. Um, so these points have to be kept in mind in, in, in the management. The management has to be a holistic one. That's, that's right. I mean, it's easy to kill the candida. There are various topical antifungals that can do it, and even systemic treatment like itraconazole or fluconazole. Um, but uh, it is important to consider the uh, predisposing factors. In the classification of skin fungal infections, you also mentioned dermatophytes. What can you tell us about this class of organisms? Okay, dermatophytes are another important um, category. These are um, multicellular uh, organisms. <clears throat> um, they can infect um, the skin, the hair and the nails. Um, and they give rise to syndromes that are uh, called uh, tinea. So tinea cruris, tinea capitis, depending tinea on the site. Anguia, depending, depending on the site. Um, they are very, very common. And what can you tell us about the common forms of tinea, tinea capitis, for example? Okay, so tinea capitis is obviously very important um, because it is a condition that, um, if not treated adequately, can result in permanent hair loss. Um, it presents in two broad, broad ways. Um, either areas that are a bit scaly associated with hair loss, that is probably the commonest. They're quite easy to recognize if you are considering the diagnosis, but like everything else, if you are not considering it, then it will be more difficult to do so. Um, examination with a woods lamp, uh, if, if, uh, if one has uh, this, this piece of equipment, is very useful because most um, uh, tinea capitis and mold, at least, um, the mycosporum species, would fluoresce green. Um, and then there's another uh, mode of presentation which is uh, more inflammatory, um, uh, the so-called carrion. And in this case you get a, a boggy swelling um, uh, in the affected area in the scalp, again associated with, with hair loss. And the swelling can be so marked that it may be misdiagnosed as an abscess. Um, and the patient might end up with, uh, for example, surgical intervention which would not be um, the correct treatment. And this, these pitfalls in management may eventually lead to uh, permanent hair loss. That's right. So it's important to recognize the, the condition and treat appropriately. Not uncommonly, I see patients referred by um, uh, good general practitioners who su correctly suspect the diagnosis uh, and yet prescribe only topical treatment, um, a topical antifungal shampoo or an antifungal lotion. Uh, this is not 
uh, sufficient because if you have involvement of the hair, the only way you can uh, eliminate the fungus in the hair follicles is by giving systemic uh, therapy. And this has to be continued long enough, um, depending on the type of fungus and, and other factors, uh, it has to be continued long enough to eliminate the infection completely. And how long would you advise uh, continuing systemic therapy? It's usually six weeks. Six weeks. Yeah. Um, but it depends on on different on on the on the mycology. In fact, it is advisable with tinea capitis to um, uh, try to culture the organism. So basically, take um, uh, samples of the hairs uh, from the affected area um, and examine um, uh, microscopically and culturing the organism. And on to a different site of infection, tinea pedis is quite common. Okay, extremely common. Um, it affects particularly the spaces between the lateral um, toes, um, um, probably because uh, anatomically the lateral toes are more sort of squashed together. So the um, environment is more moist and therefore more conducive to growth of this <coughs> um, fungus. Um, it may be asymptomatic. Um, uh, some patients um, report only very minor symptoms, but sometimes it can be itchy and the skin can be a bit painful because, it, because of the cracking. Um, you may also get superimposed bacterial infection, particularly with Pseudomonas, which gives a greenish color and a certain um, uh, odor, uh, and that's, this may complicate the clinical uh, presentation. Um, Tinea pedis uh, is usually quite easy to treat, but it's important to use the right uh, formulation of product. So if you're going to treat topically, which is sufficient in most cases, if the um, affected areas are uh, very moist, then you should go for a solution um, product pre preparation rather than a cream or ointment, because this would make the skin more moist and, and um, results would not be so good. Uh, on the other hand, if you have um, uh, the dry form of tinea pedis, which can spread on the under surface of the feet, then in those situations a cream or ointment is more effective. Doctor, in a nutshell, the most common skin infections which you've described, fungal skin infections, what is your take-home message in, your, in the management which we should approach them with? Okay, so management will vary according to the different um, type of fungus. Um, I will reiterate firstly that fungal infections are very common, um, so it is important to consider the possibility of a fungal infection uh, in most skin conditions. Um, remember that um, previous treatment may alter the clinical presentation, so the classical one would be if a topical steroid has been used um, to treat a fungal infection. Um, incidentally, I would uh, recommend avoiding topical steroid antifungal combinations except in some very particular situations like seborrheic dermatitis for example because in general if you have um, a dermatophyte infection uh, and you apply uh, topical steroid antifungal this will merely confuse the issue the antifungal effect will be um, countered by the um, pro-infective effect of the steroid and the end result will be that the infection will continue to spread. So it is important to keep this in mind and also to keep in mind that previous treatment with steroids will alter the clinical uh, presentation. Um, in cases of doubt, it is advisable to do um, skin testing, mycology testing. So this can uh, involve scrapings of skin, um, hair and the nails. We're not, we did not go into detail on, on nail infections in this in this uh, session, but nail infections are also obviously important. Um, the other point, I suppose, is that um, fungal infections um, can be contagious. Um, so certainly, for instance, in tinea carpitis, there are issues of um, infectivity um, to other to other uh, children and so on. Um, so these have to be kept in mind. Um, and remember that um, um, fungal infections um, uh, can cause um, uh, discomfort in, in some situations. So, for example, if you have tinea pedis, um, this can be uncomfortable. 
uh, but it can also cause um, uh, serious complications. So, for example, the cracking between the toes uh, of the pedis can uh, predispose to cellulitis. It's very common that you see patients admitted to um, um, general hospital uh, wards, um, correctly diagnosed as having cellulitis, given the right antibiotics, intravenous antibiotics, according to the latest guidelines, is a good recovery. And yet, uh, nobody remembers to check the skin between the toes. Uh, and if the fungal infection there is missed, then the patient will be at risk of um, further episodes uh, in, in future. Um, the last point I'd like to uh, make uh, is again regarding tinea capitis. Um, it is important to treat tinea capitis um, with systemic treatment, and this should be continued long enough uh, until the fungal infection has been uh, eliminated. Thank you, Dr. Buffa, for your time today. We hope that through our interview we managed to further your knowledge about common skin fungal infections and we also would advise you to subscribe to the Sinus Facebook page and stay in touch for further interviews. Thank you.